with today's seminar. Sorry for the delay. Um, we won't be able to broadcast live today, but we're recording and we'll post this on our website as we've done with uh, many of our other uh, seminars so that if anyone wants to watch later that you know of, you can mention to them that we'll have it up probably within a few days on our website. Um, please sign in on our attendance list. We like to keep track of the number of attendees. If, and if you want to be on our email list, you can leave me your email address. Um, we uh, also, there are announcements for the upcoming seminars. We have a number of seminars in April, including one uh, that's not on the main sustainability seminar list, and that's a special brown bag seminar coming up on April 12th. So you can take a look at that. And uh, let's see, I also wanted to bring to your attention, if anyone's interested, there's a workshop on water in a changing world that will be on Tuesday, April 17th at the iHotel. You can pick up this yellow flyer about that if you'd like to uh, attend that about water resources and, uh, and such, uh, and discussion about water research in the UK. So today, we're very happy to have with us uh, for our speaker, Dr. Carl Williard from the Department of Forestry, Center for Ecology at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. Uh, Dr. Willard is the Professor of Forest Hydrology and Watershed Management and has taught at uh, SIU since 1999. Uh, his research interests include nutrient transport, particularly of nitrogen, in agricultural watersheds, sediment transport into streams, and watershed management. Dr. Willard has his PhD uh, from Penn State University and also his MS degree from there. And he received his bachelor's degree in biology from Mihai University. So today we welcome him and the title of his talk is Water Quality Benefits of Riparian uh, Buffers in Southern Illinois Agricultural Watersheds. Welcome. Hello everyone. All right, thanks Nancy. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and share uh, with you some of the research we've been doing at SIU um, in riparian buffers, in uh, ag watershed research in general. And I wanted to first acknowledge, uh, first and foremost, my co-author, uh, John Schoonover. He's an associate professor uh, in hydrology in our department as well. He was a strategic hire. Uh, I think he started in uh, 2005, 2006. Uh, and him and I have developed a really good working relationship. Much of the research, almost all of the research I'm presenting today is collaborative research with him. So I wanted to acknowledge him uh, on, on that first slide. All right. Uh, probably everybody here is familiar with what a riparian buffer zone is, that transitional area between uh, the terrestrial ecosystem and then the aquatic ecosystem. In ag watersheds, we talk about, you know, you, you hear lots of different terms, but you hear the term riparian buffer. If you go to an NRCS office, to them, that will mean you're planting trees in that riparian buffer. If you say you want a filter strip, they'll put in grasses. Uh, in the forestry arena, we have riparian areas as well. We refer to those as streamside management zones. And actually, the idea for riparian buffers in ag watersheds originally came out of uh, the forestry arena, so that's interesting. Uh, here in the Midwest, typically we're talking about a buffer anywhere between 30 to 100 feet, uh, depending upon the slope of the land coming into the buffer and uh, the size of the stream you're dealing with. So why are they important? Uh, I grew up playing sports in Pennsylvania. Uh, I was a wrestler and a football player, so I, I use a football analogy here. I, I think of a riparian buffer sort of as the last line of defense. Uh, it's sort of like having a really good free safety on your football team. I know things have been struggling up here uh, with your football team, <laughs> and we have lots of our own issues at Penn State and SIU with that as well. Uh, but it is, it's sort of that last chance to get some nutrient sequestration before that nitrogen or phosphorus makes it into uh, the stream. So they trap sediment, um, they sequester nutrients in surface runoff, you get a lot of nutrient processing in groundwater as well, which I'll, I'll show some of that data. Uh, we stabilize stream banks, we can shade streams. For here in the Midwest, uh, not so important. 
because uh, you have a lot of prairie, natural prairie streams here that are warm water streams. But where I grew up in the east, we had a lot of cold water systems and riparian buffers were very important to maintaining shade for the fish and other aquatic organisms that live in those streams. Uh, here in the Midwest, very important wildlife habitat areas. As we know, most of the state of Illinois, especially your region, uh, is predominated by agricultural land uses. So these riparian corridors can really serve as important wildlife habitat areas. And then last but not least is an opportunity for landowners to diversify income, either through uh, timber, also in our, our neck of the woods in Southern Illinois, hunting leases are becoming more and more uh, important sources of income for farmers uh, during, during that dormant season. So, why do we need to quantify the benefits of different best management practices like riparian buffers? Well, all of you are aware of all the different government uh, programs that involve some type of accounting system. We need to know, if we put a buffer on the ground, how many pounds of phosphorus is it going to sequester? How many pounds of nitrogen? For things like TMDLs. If you look at the TMDL legislation, not only are they supposed to do waste load allocations from point sources, but also the original Clean Water Act land, which talks about waste load allocations from non-point sources, which becomes much more difficult, as you are all well aware of. We also have this thing way out, you know, this started back when I first started at SIU, the idea of nutrient standards for all surface waters during the Clinton administration. And this has sort of been in the background. I know there's a working group has been formed and has had activity on and off in, uh, in Illinois for developing nutrient standards for our state as well. So currently we have, you know, we have the phosphorus standards for streams that are going into lakes. We have the nitrogen standard, 10 milligrams per liter of nitrate N for watersheds that are used for drinking water. But beyond that, we don't have nutrient standards. So this would be a big, if this were to pass, and, and you know, depending upon the federal legislation and push for this, this would obviously have a huge impact on a state like Illinois. And then last but not least is the hypoxia situation in the Gulf of Mexico. And I think this has one of been the big drivers, a lot of nutrient management research uh, here in the Midwest in the Mississippi River watershed, as the Mississippi is a large contributor of both nitrogen and phosphorus to the Gulf and the associated hypoxia issues that they're having. Here's a, uh, just a graph from NOAA, or a figure from NOAA showing summer fog planting conditions along the Gulf Coast. You can see the red areas are those areas where you have uh, more phytoplankton. So as you know, this comes and goes, each eutrophication, some years it's bigger, but it has been correlated, lots of been good research being done correlated with the amount of, of nitrogen uh, specifically coming into the Gulf, primarily from the Mississippi River drainage. So there's a group at USGS, uh, Richard Alexander's group has been doing a lot of modeling along the Mississippi River uh, watershed. And this is one of its earlier papers, but showing that watersheds in close proximity to the river and its primary tributaries are real important end contributors to the Gulf. So you can see the areas highlighted in uh, the dark pink or dark red are those areas that are the you know, most important contributors. You can see southern Illinois extending up into central Illinois. Areas that have basically short travel times within your tributary streams or rivers to the main stem are those where we're going to get a lot of that nitrogen. Once it gets into one of our streams, there's a pretty good chance that that nitrogen is going to make it into the river. And then you can think of the Mississippi River. You get some nutrient processing in the river, but not near as much as some of our smaller systems. So the bulk of that water it doesn't have a chance to interact with the bed and banks where we get more of the microbial processing occurring. So a lot of that nitrogen will end up being transported to the Gulf, and there's lots of good modeling work uh, to show that. All right, back to Southern Illinois. We're a little bit different, of course, than the Champaign area in Central Illinois. A little less agriculture, though we have our fair amount of agriculture. We have more uh, forested land use. We have the Shawnee National Forest. Uh, we also have the Cache River area. 
uh, which is an important wetland complex to the south of us. And one of the big things hydrologically is where tile drainage is just starting to come in to southern Illinois. So we have a relative absence of tile drainage compared to the, the central and northern part of the state. So <clears throat> when we're dealing with watersheds and we're thinking about what BMPs would be best to utilize to try to minimize nutrient transport to streams, if you have a tile drain watershed, a riparian buffer is not going to work well for you because most of the water moving through those tile drains is not going to interact with the soils and vegetation in that buffer. So they're using things like constructed wetlands. I know Richard Cook uh, in Ag Engineering here has some, some bioreactors adding labile carbon to try to increase denitrification uh, from, from water that's moving through tile drains. And so this has been a nice place for John and I to do research because we have a more natural hydrologic regime we have more of the water is moving through the actual soil, through the buffer, where we can get some renovation before it hits the stream. We also have a unique native species, giant cane, which you can see in the picture. It's a native bamboo species uh, to southern Illinois. It's at the very northern extent of its range. If you can see the hatched area uh, moves up into just north of Carbondale. Um, and that is a very important species in terms of, uh, well, let me back up. We had these cane breaks. I mentioned the Cache River watershed. Um, there were reports that, you know, when the first Europeans came, uh, mile-wide swaths of giant cane within. And some of that is due to some of the Native American burning that was being done and also uh, agricultural. But, We've now lost a lot of these big cane breaks that, that were once part of the Cache River Valley and throughout Southern Illinois. And we have these small remnant patches that you can see in this photo. So a lot was lost due to urban and agricultural conversion. Uh, these cane breaks serve as uh, habitat for a variety of, of unique species. So a lot of the IDNR, for instance, Illinois Natural History Survey is very interested in uh, trying to restore giant cane back onto the landscape. You can see one of the big ones is uh, neotropical migratory birds. Swainson's warbler utilizes cane break. That's one, one of its main habitats. Uh, reptiles like the cane break rattlesnake. There's a gentleman that works for the Illinois Natural History Survey. I don't know his name, unfortunately, but has found new genera of moss that are only reside in cane breaks. He was doing research in some of the cane breaks in, in southern Illinois. All right, so what have we been doing? Um, in this first project, I'm going to talk about three different projects that we've worked on since I've been at SIU. This first one was a plot level project looking at the water quality benefits of both forest and giant cane buffers in the Cache River watershed, and we were looking at nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment attenuation capabilities by those two different buffer types, and those were adjacent to row crop agriculture. And this would, these were done at three different sites, and you see we're down there in extreme southern Illinois, in Union, Johnson, and Pulaski counties, and these were all done on some of the, well, two of the tributary streams, Big Creek and Cypress Creek, and incidentally, Big Creek is one that uh, Illinois Water Survey is doing a lot of uh, sediment modeling on. Uh, Cypress Creek is another primary trip. And then we had one side on the main stem of the Cache River. Here's one of our plots. Uh, you can see pretty nice giant cane stains, approximately 30, 40 year old. And those are found you know, right along the agricultural field margin between the stream and agricultural field. It does like light. It does do better in uh, better light conditions. So you may have a canopy there of a few tree widths, you know, a few crown widths across, and then you'll commonly see patches of giant cane uh, between the forest and the agricultural field. And then we had a young, relatively young, mixed deciduous forest adjacent uh, to the giant cane plots that we were monitoring as well. You can see what we wanted to do is sort of capture both surface runoff and groundwater, and also uh, we did some soil water work. I won't show that data. But the surface runoff and groundwater, as it traveled through 
the uh, riparian buffers. So we had overland flow collectors at uh, 10 feet, 20 feet, and 30 feet into the buffer, and then at the field edge at, uh, at zero meters. And then we also had wells where we were collecting in the shallow groundwater. And we have a sand and gravel aquifer that we're dealing with uh, in southern Illinois. That, and you'll see those water tables fluctuate pretty significantly during the growth season. So here's just some photos of our, we use dustpan overland flow collectors uh, to sample surface runoff. We have groundwater wells and then some suction lysimers to look at salt water in the buffer. So here's, uh, and these, are, these numbers are on a mass basis. Uh, so we collected the total volume of runoff uh, that were coming into each one of those different uh, widths you would say, and looked at compared to giant cane and forest. So we're looking at both sediment, we looked at uh, total phosphate, ammonium, uh, dissolved ammonium, and then dissolved nitrate. You see the giant cane did pretty well. Uh, and this is only in the first 10 feet of that buffer. We're getting uh, between 68 to 97 percent uh, attenuation or losses of those uh, constituents and the main mechanism is, of course, it's not necessarily filtering, but it's actual infiltration of that water. It's moving, so it's, when that water infiltrates, we have relatively high infiltration rates in these riparian buffers. So when that water infiltrates, it's gonna drop sediment, right? So that's, that would be attenuation of sediment, and any of the sediment-bound nutrients, commonly phosphorus, it can be sediment bound. But we also have any dissolved nutrients like your dissolved ammonium and your dissolved nitrate will move into the soil at that point where we can get some renovation, microbial uptake, we can get things like denitrification occurring. Uh, and you see the forest did well, uh, but not quite as well as the giant cane. And this giant cane uh, has a lot of rhizomes and then it shoots up culms, so it's uh, it uh, reproduces vegetatively, primarily. Um, so a lot of dense, a very dense rooting network that helps give that riparian buffer relatively high infiltration rates, even compared to the, the forest buffer. You see by the 6.6 .6 meters or 20 feet into the buffer, you see the forest now is probably doing as well uh, in some cases better than the giant cane. And there's lots of variability associated with these numbers. These are not uh, very clear-cut numbers because, of course, you have a lot of differences in flow paths of water coming through those buffers and so on. But th these type of numbers are pretty similar to what groups at Iowa State, Dick Schultz and Tom Eisenhart's group up at Bear Creek uh, in Ames, Iowa, what they're showing, uh, and look, Richard Lawrence's group uh, with the USDA ARS down in uh, Tifton, Georgia, showing in, in some of the buffers they study on the coastal plain. So here's some groundwater um, data from those same buffers, and you can see over on the uh, on the left hand side. It's actually I don't have it marked here, but that's the giant cane buffer. Yeah, I somehow I got missed when I translated these. Uh, and then on the right is a forest buffer. You can see the groundwater concentrations were relatively low even coming into the giant cane compared to the forest buffer. In the forest buffer, we actually see a fairly nice drop in um, nitrate concentrations as it's moving through the buffer. Now, we did not measure denitrification rates or potential denitrification rates. Wow, well, that would have been nice to do, but you, we can assume uh, that a lot of that nitrate loss is, is probably due to denitrification, some planned uptake. But the, during the growing season, those water table, that water table will drop significantly due to ET uh, in those buffers. So you'll get, um, we hypothesize that you're probably not getting a lot of root uptake of nutrients because it's moving through even as deep as uh, 15, 20 feet below the surface. Whereas during the dormant season, that water table will be as high as five, uh, seven, eight feet below the surface. And then on the, what we hypothesize is going on in the giant cane buffers to the left, 
is we're thinking that routing network is probably moving out into the field, probably even more so than the forest vegetation. That's one of our thoughts. And so we may even be getting quite a bit of nutrient renovation because remember, for that denitrification, one of the things you need to have there beyond the nitrate and the anoxic conditions, you need labile carbon. And a lot of that's coming probably from root exudates, either from the, the tree roots or the giant cane roots. So we're thinking there's probably some uptake, also denitrification occurring at that field boundary and even out into the field uh, from some of the, the effects of the giant cane that's grown along. And then phosphate. First thing you notice is pretty significant phosphate movement in groundwater. So we can't always assume phosphate just moves with sediment. In our part of the world, we have pHs, groundwater pHs around in the mid to high sixes, 6.4, 6.6, 6.7. And that happens to be the perfect pH range for phosphorus to be in solution. So we can get, a, you know, if you're talking about a half milligram per liter to 0.6 milligrams per liter, five, that's high for groundwater. Those are some of the higher numbers you'll see in the literature. But we've, we've shown this over and over at different sites. And you see this even in the Kaskaskia watershed. We've done, we had a recent USDA project looking at water quality in the Kaskaskia. And that's their issue too. It's, it's more of a phosphorus issue than it is a nitrogen issue. Um, whereas up here, you probably, your main nutrient concern is probably more nitrate because of all the tidal drainage that you're getting. Um, so you can see, we do get some reduction as it's moving through the buffer. We're dropping from about 0 0.6, 0 0.7, uh, you know, at the 9, you see maybe 0.4. It's messy, but you can see it over on the forest, too. We get, we get some drop, uh, but not near as well as, as we saw for, for nitrate. All right, as I said before, Southern Illinois is a region with relatively high stream DRP concentrations. Uh, tributaries of Kaskaskia, also the Big Muddy watershed has, has significant phosphorus levels. Uh, several watersheds with mean DRP concentrations greater than one milligram per liter. That's high, folks. For, if you're not used to looking at those numbers, that's really high for, for phosphorus. And that's, this is from a, uh, a conglomeration of the IEPA, IDNR water quality data that uh, I think this report, short 99, was done by uh, IDNR put together. And we have mean DRP concentrations in the state, about a quarter uh, milligram per liter. So significantly higher than the rest of the state. And these were some of our, that we measured, uh, our stream phosphate concentrations, uh, a little bit over half milligram per liter. So this sort of matched uh, some of the other monitoring that's been going on. And obviously, phosphorus is, is a nutrient we're concerned about. All right. So, I leave behind the plot level experiments, and I, had, uh, I should mention I had a string of, of three master students do that work uh, for their thesis work, and they kept adding on and, and looking at different constituents to that. But then when John came on board, he got his PhD from, from Auburn University with Graham Lockerbie. He was also interested in, in nutrient transport and had done research on riparian buffers. So we thought, well, if we're going to be here at SIU for a long time, we should start a long-term paired watershed experiment looking at the watershed scale impact of riparian buffers on water quality. So this is scaling up to the small watershed scale. You can see on the right, uh, these are watersheds on our experimental farms property. Uh, the, the university owns uh, 3,000 acres to the, to the west of campus. And we actually did a five-year calibration period. So we started in 2007. We put in partial flumes, you can see on the left there, in, um, in three of the watersheds. One of the watersheds we've dropped out because it's, it's behaving you know, significantly different than the other two hydrologically. So we're, we're now monitoring two of the watersheds. One's going to serve as our control. And then this spring, we're actually, actually one of John's students is, is gearing up to start planting both uh, switchgrass and giant cane in, um, in the other experimental watershed. And then we're going to follow those water quality changes over time. So we have the baseline data, how both of those watersheds 
how much nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment is being transported through those watersheds. And then, of course, we're going to keep the agricultural management the same. So the only thing we're changing would be the fact that there's a riparian buffer in that watershed. So they were basically, we had them farm up to the stream banks, or as close to the stream banks as, as they could. And now we're going to put in a 30-foot uh, wide buffer on both sides of, of giant cane and switchgrass. And you can see, just like any other restoration work, it takes a while for you to see the benefits. We're not necessarily, most studies show, you're going to see those benefits in the first couple of years. But over time, as your vegetation's establishing, you're adding organic matter, you're adding labile carbon to the soils, you're building back up those carbon levels, then you start seeing some, some nice impacts on, on water quality. Not to mention a restoration of the soil biology within those systems. And that's a whole nother, whole nother run. All right, we had another project where we were looking at, stop me Nancy if I'm going too long. Um, um, where we look at more just specifically surface runoff moving from agricultural fields into riparian buffers. And what John and I noticed as we were doing a lot of our other riparian work and when we were out looking around for, for new sites to do our research is we kept coming across these concentrated flow areas that were moving into the buffers. Because if you read the riparian literature and are familiar with that, and even our study, most people will assume that you have sheet flow coming into the buffer. And the buffers are designed to handle sheet flow. And that's nice to say, and we all nod our head and put it in our jar argument, yes, we assume sheet flow like everybody else. And we kept saying, how much sheet flow is actually out there by the time it hits the buffer? And the more we walked and the more we talked, very little, just like you guys are all shaking your head. And so why are we designing these studies to, with this assumption of sheep flow? So this does fly in the face of a lot of the existing uh, riparian literature, uh, but we've shifted a little bit of our focus to really focus on just first quantifying how important concentrated flow is coming from agricultural fields. And of course, it's going to differ depending on the region you're in. You know, here in southern Illinois, we have a lot of, you know, more clay soils. We get more surface runoff than you probably get up here. Uh, so parts, parts of this um, you do as well, I'm sure, too. But we did this research. Ryan Pankow, who's now working for the NRCS, did this as his master's project in the Cache River Watershed. Um, <laughs> So I just went through this. Buffers are designed to trap sediment and nutrients in shallow dispersed sheep flow. Yeah, we have that from parking lots, and yeah, we have that maybe at the start of an agricultural field, maybe further up the slope. But as that water moves down slope, it's going to naturally concentrate. And most times it's going to be in a concentrated form uh, when it hits that buffer. So under these conditions, buffers work well. Just like I showed you, you know, about four or five slides, 60 to 90% of sediment and nutrients are deposited in the buffers, and there's lots of research showing that. And by no means am I saying there's never sheet flow out there, so we don't want to just throw out all that research, So because there is sheet flow happening, uh, and that, that can be important. So I went through this, I'm getting ahead of myself, getting a little excited here. Uh, but if you look at an agricultural field, is it flat? There's microtopography there. It's not a parking lot, as much as we may like it to be a parking lot. It has microtopography, and anytime you have microtopography, that's going to lead to flow concentration as that water is flowing down slope. So we get rills forming, we get concentrated flow paths. Now, a big concentrated flow path, we would put a grass waterway on. So we have BMPs developed. What we're talking about are those concentrated flow paths that are smaller that you want to go to the NRCS office, they would laugh at you if you said, yeah, I want a grass waterway put on this concentrated flow path. So we're talking about those, and guess what? There's a lot more of the small ones than there are the big ones. At least by our visual observation and, and Ryan's work in, in the Cache River watershed. So here we have, you can see in the left-hand picture, is one of my old grainy pictures, um, 
from this is actually along Cypress Creek at the first riparian study site. You can see presence of sheet flow there out in the field during the storm event in the middle of that photo. And of course, then on the right, you can see now this would be a bigger concentrated flow channel, uh, something on the order we'd probably put a grass water in for something that amount of flow. But that, you get the idea of what we're talking about. And then we have this another animal we're dealing with, um, sediment berms. So remember, we talked about one of the benefits of buffers is, of course, you have water coming in that's carrying sediment. When it hits the buffer, you have high infiltration rates there. You get water <coughs> infiltrating, but what happens to the sediment? It drops out. And they work so well. We get most of that sediment dropping out in the first 10 feet, maybe the first two or three feet. So I like to say our buffers are working themselves to death. Because now, and this is another thing John and I visually address, I see shaking your heads, that's good. We get some corroboration here. That we can get berms being built. If you have a buffer there for a long period of time, you can get so much sediment deposition that you get berms start building up. So these mounds of, of deposited material. And now what happens when the next surface runoff event comes in and hits that berm? What's going to happen? Is it going to go through the berm? No. It's going to further concentrate and run along the berm until it finds a low spot in the berm and then blow through. But now it's in an even more concentrated form, more energy, more power to erode. All right? Now, what is another possible source of these sediment berms other than coming from the agricultural field? Anybody know? Anybody think about this stuff? Flooding. Yes, very good. So flooding. Because we're going to get flood events, and that's going to deposit set. So Ryan actually tried to figure out using different iron concentrations and, and stuff, some of the tools John had learned at Auburn, and using texture, uh, trying to figure out <coughs> the origin of these berms. Were they coming from flooding, or were they coming from the agriculture field? And guess what? That didn't work out so well. We could never really answer that question, at least at our side. So that's we're thinking of good PhD projects. If there are any good PhD students uh, in the audience who want to get a PhD, that's something we think would make a great PhD project. Uh, but that's something we continue to be interested in. The formation, the origin of these berms, how they function hydrologically uh, within the buffer. And this is a conceptual model. This is the paper, Ryan, we just got published in Agroforestry Systems. Uh, that should actually read 2012. Um, or no, that's right, it was the end of 11. But anyway, you see the progression of how they can form, uh, how concentrated flow paths can form in the buffers. And you can see he did a lot of nice GIS work showing where these forms, berms can form. You can see the buffer elevation change. So in the red, that's where you would have more, the higher elevations where you're getting that position. So they weren't just, you know, they were at different spots through that buffer. Sometimes they were in the middle, sometimes they were in the back, which you'd expect more from flooding, at least the sanding, you know, the heavier portion of material would drop out quicker. Uh, and sometimes they were up front. So that's, that remains a bit of a mystery. Uh, but we had this firm formation then leading to even more concentration. And once you have that CFP, what we call a concentrated flow path, that's not so good for the buffer, right? Because that's going to move through that buffer without a lot of renovation, or not a lot of infiltration, because it's already in a concentrated, relatively powerful form in terms of its energy. All right, so Ryan did a little bit about his study. One of the main questions he wanted to ask, very simple question, but guess what? You can't find this answer in the literature. So this was one of the main things I think our paper hopefully will be cited for, is what proportion of an agricultural field is drained by concentrated flow? I mean, all the research we've done, and at least we can't find really studies that have focused on answering that question. So what Ryan did is intensive surveying of 10 different agricultural fields to create detailed digital elevation models. So he was out there with the total station and 
I hate to even admit how many data points we have in survey, but here's an example. 4,000 survey points on what this field. And you can see very concentrated in the riparian area because we had to know, you know, not only for the berm work, but we wanted to know where these concentrated flow paths were and what, you know, very detailed elevation data on those three sites. And you can see where it's 10 fields. Again, we're in Cypress Creek, Big Creek, and also Mill Creek, one of the watersheds to the west of uh, the main stem of Cash River. So, the long and short of it is, now this, again, it's based on these 10 fields in Southern Illinois, is that 82 to 100% of those fields were drained by concentrated flow. Now, one of the big assumptions we made, as you can see in this picture, when you have one of these concentrated flow paths that you can see in the dark blue, that's going to drain water from that entire upslope portion of the field. So you, we sort of made mini watersheds, if you will, like it does in GIS, the four-point method, if, if you use GIS to do watershed work. And we took that all the way up top because we made the assumption, you know, even if water overland flow was generated at the headwater portion of that field, it would eventually end up in that concentrated flow path. But that is a big assumption. I mean, it may or may not, uh, may or may not happen. But we, that's been published, so, uh, so at least it, it's gone through the process. All right, so the next, phase, if you will, of this research idea, and this is something we're working on right now uh, with a grant from the USDA or NRCS, a, a conservation innovation grant. And this is more of a demonstration project actually than a research project. <clears throat> but we want to basically come up with an idea of how can we better build or design a riparian buffer to handle concentrated flow. Now that we're pretty certain, at least in our part of the world, that it exists and it's important, we can't just be slapping out buffers like we always have. Just a static width, 30 to 50, 60 feet buffer and call it good. I mean, I, to me, I'm obviously interested in applied research. Um, that will hopefully have some impact on how we manage the landscape. So we did this in two headwater agriculture watersheds in southern Illinois, both row crop agriculture, corn and soybean rotation. Uh, and this is actually on, on one of our larger producers' properties. We were able to talk him and his brother into cooperating with this research project, and we're going to be hopefully planting uh, these buffers this spring. But we're getting pretty pretty close to our deadline here. Um, first thing we did is we went out again and surveyed all along those that headwater stream that you can see in blue, the main stem. And all those little yellow mini watersheds, those are our areas of concentrated flow and their uh, essential drainage network moving into them. So you can see in this watershed again, we're getting 86% of the field areas that drain towards that stream channel is moving into a concentrated flow path or channel before it hits the stream. And our other one, our second site, is about 60%. So that does have more, more sheet flow. We can't forget about the sheet flow, but uh, we got to start thinking about concentrated flow as well. So, now don't laugh, but this is our idea of how, thinking a little bit outside the box, if you will, of how can we take a stab at redesigning a buffer that a farmer will actually plant. Because we can't, originally we're thinking, ah, oh, well, we'll, we can go way out in the field and put switch grass and, and maybe even add some rock to try to limit the erosion. And, you know, John's really good about this, even better than I am, but he's like, what farmer's going to do that? 
Are we, is this an academic exercise, or are we actually trying to come up with something a farmer would utilize? So, being the practical person he is, he started thinking about, well, what's the planting width, typical planting width of the equipment farmers use in Southern Law? So it's typically about 60 feet wide. Um, so we started thinking, well, maybe we could come up with blocks. And let's just, and this is still in sort of the idea phase, but we're actually going to put these out, see how they work. So we're talking about 60 feet, but we have a 20 foot, let me back up, we have a 20 foot, very narrow buffer. Remember John's work, our original work, showed, you know, a 20, 30 foot buffer did really well for sheet flow that were coming in. So we're going to keep that, we're going to knock it down to 20 feet. The way we sold this is our area has to be equal to or less than a traditional buffer that may be put in like in our negative width, it may be 72 feet. And I asked Scott Martin, our NRCS rep, why 72 feet in Jackson County? Well, it's due to the old spraying regulations for atrocy. They had to be at least 72 feet away from the streams when they sprayed. So that's why they started just, hey, let's make our buffers that wide then the farmers will be safe when they go out and, and spray the fields. And they still, to this day, use that 72 foot wide. Okay, back to our, we were thinking about buffer bulbs, and more of this shape, and then, you know, we came, we finally settled on this buffer, what we're calling a buffer block, but they're variable width, in that you have this relatively narrow width, 20 feet, but then where you have a concentrated flow path, we're going to have a block of vegetation 40 feet wide and 60 to 120 feet long, depending upon the size and length of your concentrated flow path. So when that farmer comes along, he can still, you know, if he's planting or whatever he's doing, he can just raise up, go over the block, put it back down, and it's a nice static width. So he can come along the next pass and he's right on there. So we're hoping, we tried to build in some farmer acceptance into our design. So here we're going to try to use primarily switch grass, but also mix in some big blue stem uh, native prairie grass. What we need is, we know we need stiff stem grasses, because we want to break up some of that concentrated flow. We want to break up as much of that as we can and disperse it so we can get more of that infiltrating before it reaches the buffer. So we're, we're thinking about, you know, think about this, you're almost establishing hedges, multiple hedges of vegetation. So when that concentrated flow is moving in, it hits a hedge, hopefully it spreads out a little bit, hits another hedge, and, and so on. Um, and that idea is actually in the NRCS protocols, but nobody ever uses it. For one thing, I don't think a lot of landowners know these stiff stem grass hedges are actually uh, an accepted standard BMP practice and just not readily utilized. Uh, we think in part because they haven't really thought as much about landowner and farmer acceptance. Um, but lo and behold, we also think we may have to put some rock in there because some of these concentrated flow paths are big. If we just try to establish grass in there, it's probably going to blow out, and we're going to be right back where we started. So we may have to use some rock to get it stable, then put some soil over it to see, and hopefully that will be stable enough that we can get um, keep that vegetation in there. Yeah? So you don't think the water will just tend to flow throughout? Well, that's why we're hopefully, with that 40-foot width, uh, and with the multiple hedges, that yes, you are going to get some flow around, but every time you force it to flow around, you're also, you know, hopefully, when you're dispersing like that, you're, you're reducing energy. So if you do that enough of times, we're, you know, we're still, we're not going to, this isn't going to be 100% fix all. You know, you're still going to have, I think, some concentrated flow, uh, but hopefully it's a lot, lot less than it would be without it. And we're, you know, John and I were just on the phone with the landowner 
late last week, is we need to get these things planted. We're like you guys, very warm. We're about two weeks ahead of schedule down in Southern Illinois. Uh, so we need to think about getting these planted very shortly, here at the end of March, which we're in now. <laughs> or April, hopefully our April. So project summary for this, concentrate flow can be uh, the dominant form of surface runoff entering buffers. Traditional buffers aren't really designed to handle that. So we're, we're thinking about using variable width buffers with buffer blocks of equal or less area. And that's a key point for landowner acceptance. They are not going to put, and it's even worse up here. They are not, well, first of all, they're not going to use trees. We're a forestry department. Of course, we're always trying to jam the trees in there. But we have the same trouble you guys have. Nobody, no serious producer wants to deal with trees because they've been fighting trees their whole life. Right? And they want the trees out. So we, I think at some point we have to acknowledge some of these things and, uh, and utilize some things that they may accept, like grasses. Um, as much as it hurts us to do that as, as forestry professionals. Um, and we want to focus the vegetation where it's needed, where the flow is. And then, of course, design for ease of planting and harvesting to maximize farm acceptance. All right, so overall conclusions from our study. And I really didn't highlight this one, but I sort of did at the end. Is relatively narrow buffers. You know, 20, 30 feet, 10 feet can give you significant water quality benefits. Now, does that mean we run out and just plant 10 foot buffers everywhere? I don't know. I don't think so. We like we would say no, because you have multiple benefits. Like, is a ten foot buffer going to provide a lot of wildlife habitat? No. So if you're concerned about multiple things, of course, state of Illinois, thankfully for us as researchers, water quality is the big issue or one of the big issues. But there's other important things that buffers do. Um, so we're thinking. More than that, 30 foot is, is probably better. 20 foot at the minimum would be would be something you could possibly use. Um, but in surface runoff, they are areas that promote a lot of infiltration. We get in groundwater probably a lot of plant assimilation and also microbial assimilation and then things like microbial denitrification. The giant cane buffers they perform equally as well as or better than the forest buffers in terms of benefits. So. There's a lot of data backing up putting giant cane into restoration designs. And now it's gotten to the point where one of our colleagues, Jim Zaychek, is working a lot on cane propagation because there's a lot of interest by the federal and state agencies. And nobody has the material to get it out because it's, it's not easily uh, propagated. So he's developing a lot of that work in the greenhouse. Uh, in Southern Illinois, P tends to be more of a stream water quality issue than N that we deal with. Um, and then riparian buffers, we think, need to be designed to handle concentrated flow. <clears throat> so I want to acknowledge uh, Chris Blattle, Chad Yokum, they were two of the students, master students on that first project. Blair Boris, uh, is current master students, helping us a lot with the uh, surveying on the, the latest NRCS project. And also Jessica Peace, her research is, is on that paired watershed study that we're starting here this spring. Scott Martin and Ryan Pankoff have uh, been great cooperators on the uh, Conservation Innovation Grant. And then uh, CIFAR, Max Stennis, uh, Freck, which John has, has gotten money from the Illinois Department of Agriculture to do the paired watershed work. And then uh, the USDA NRCS conservation information right? And that's, that's actually a photo, not from Illinois, but from Iowa, but the Bear Creek watershed that I visited. Uh, Dick Schultz and Tom Eisenberg when I was on SPAD. So they, they do a lot of really good work there as well. Well, thank you very much, and we'll have some time for questions. If, you know, if I could ask you to repeat the question I asked. Yeah. I, I think your idea of, of keeping the, the current maximum area of buffer zone is fantastic as far as farmer utilization. 
when you when you change from that that buffer strip or, or that buffer zone against the, the river itself to the buffer blocks, in terms of both runoff capture and other benefits of, of these buffer zones, uh, how do the cane and the stiff grasses stand up to multiple passes across the field? We don't know yet. <laughs> well, we don't, let me answer, I guess I should repeat. <laughs> so how do our buffer blocks hold up to multiple passes over the field by the producer? Um, that's something we want to assess. And I didn't say how we're ex assessing the success of these buffer blocks is actually through uh, monitoring the dimensions of those concentrated flow paths. Um, and I should have said that, but using survey, because it's, it's, there's not, unfortunately, a lot of money in that grant for monitoring. So we're going to be doing that on our own, monitoring are these flow paths stable once we do the restoration, or are they actually growing again? So we're going to have to come out and periodically, with our surveying equipment, just take some, some uh, profiles, some cross-sections of, of them so we can document. And that's probably only going to happen once a year, maybe twice a year at the most. But, so hopefully that will tell us. But Giant Cane will not be part of that project, um, even though we think in the long run it could be. I didn't say giant cane is notoriously a slow starter. Um, it takes two or three years to really, you know, get its roots established, and then it'll start growing. Those stands, you know, I can show you two, three-year-old stands. They're only like that. They're like, oh, that looks so good. Uh, so, but once they get going, you know, once they're established, you know, a five-year-old stand looks a lot, lot different than a two or three-year-old stand. And we think they could be part of it, though they're going to get so tall and stiff stemmed uh, that I don't know how it will work with them like going over top and stuff. Because they're evergreen too. They're going to stay green year round. Um, they're an evergreen deciduous or whatever. I'm not a <laughs> vegetation ecologist or a plant biologist, but uh, they, they drop their leaves periodically instead of, you know, like a deciduous tree. Does that answer your question? Sort of? Yeah, it does in terms of the, uh, cane. the watershed um, potential. I'm curious about other benefits of buffer research, for example. Like yeah. And thankfully, we have a wildlife ecologist, Clay Nielsen, who's joined our department. Um, and him and I are working on a collaborative project in a mine reclamation area up in uh, Burning Star 4, um, just to the north of us in the Pickneyville area, um, where we're looking at riparian buffers that were created as part of a stream restoration where they actually moved the whole stream and then restored it uh, following the mining activities that were done in the late 80s and early 90s. So his student is looking at the wildlife habitat potential of that, and my students <coughs> is looking at a lot of the soil uh, quality and are we actually getting uh, soil quality function after 10 years post restoration? So, but it's in a mine landscape. But the nice part about that study is you're starting with the same soils everywhere because they're all, you know, from a reclaimed uh, mining operation, they were all really laid down in a relatively similar fashion. Well, have you considered biomass production there? Yes. Uh, and there's a lot of interest here in this campus, which is pretty much like uh, the giant cane. Right. But it dries and it can be harvested for biomass. Right. You may actually make those uh, uh, areas larger, wider, and deeper. Right. Uh, so How old stiff? Well, repeat question. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was um, Have we considered miscanthus? It's a grass that has a lot of biofuel potential. I know U of I is doing a lot of work in that area. Um, no. The answer first is no on miscanthus, but it's something you know, we could think about. Um, I guess my question back is how stiff-stemmed is it? Is it a... Pretty much like what you showed. With, uh, with as stiff as switchgrass? It's or stiffer than that. Oh, stiffer? Yeah. Oh, 
Well, but now we're talking. Uh, right. Yeah, that would be something. It's like also. But it isn't native. Yes, but there's a lot of interesting growth. Right, I know, I know. Uh, but that's something some folks get concerned about. And I know that's something. But USDA is okay with it. Right. You know, that it's as good as fish grass in the area. I have a couple of questions related to that. Does it, let me do that. Does it do as well in our climate as it does yeah. here? It's actually better than the Okay. That's the best day, yeah. So warmer climate would be better? Warmer right? Okay. Um, what about water in the river? Because you're stopping the water to reach the river. What about the river? And well, we're, hope, you know, we're getting that water to infiltrate. So it's still moving through the soil water. It's recharging the local groundwater, and it will... Make it. some of that will make it to the street. Yeah, that's the idea. We don't want to necessarily dam it up. We want it to slow down. We want it to have more opportunity for infiltration. But a lot of the vegetation will suck the water. And it yes. Enough. And that's okay with us. Now it may not be for a water per supply the perspective. Yeah, the <laughs> may not be that good. Right. Just like we like denitrification as as uh, water quality people. But the air quality folks don't like if it just it's incomplete and comes off as nitrous oxide, a greenhouse gas. But we don't worry about that, right? Because we're water quality people, and we like nitrate renovation. <laughs> but I'm being facetious. But yes, that is if you're concerned about water supply, that would be something we'd have to look at. But I still think why like in the river, obviously not just water right, supply. Right. Right. What about fish grass spread? Well, that's the nice part about being in an active ag landscape, even though it will, you know, it has the capability to spread somewhat, the landowner is not going to allow a lot of spread, you know, because he, this is his corn and soybean field. So they're going to hopefully keep it, you know, within, not let it spread too far from those blocks. But yeah, that's always a concern with any vegetation, even the giant cane that we plant. Um, Miscanthus, that's not a problem because it's not uh, spreading by seeds, it's by rhizomes. Right. And it can be controlled. Like giant cane. Yeah. You're, you're, you're getting me interested on the miscanthus. Yeah. That's something we need to look at. In your experience, what kind of maintenance do you guys need to do to promote giant cane? Good question, Will. So the question was, what kind of maintenance do we need to do to promote giant cane and buffers? And actually, Jim Zaychek has a student looking at this very topic, uh, Margaret Anderson, who's researching uh, fire, use of fire. Well, she's researching more how can we promote the establishment of it, so utilizing fire. But fire can also be utilized to, I think, help maintain it. Um, she's also looking at fertilization, and she's looking at... I don't know if she's doing herbicide or not, but she may be using some herbicides too, uh, to try to, how can we, because it is a slow start, how can we help it to, to maybe jump start it and get, get some better growth? But in terms of the maintenance is, I think, you know, obviously tillage is a big, big one. That's always been done. But also the burning uh, is another big one. Though, it is, you know, it's sort of a fire, I don't know if you'd say adapted, uh, species, but it will come back strong after a fire because it's coming off of those rhizomes, the columns. Um, and, you know, that is something just like the gentleman here was saying about switchgrass, that is a concern somewhat about giant cane, is that it will spread too much in the field. Uh, my concern is kind of the other way. Yes, with the pressure from exotic species, push on these yeah. stuff, a lot of all stuff like that. Um, yeah, how can we get a good native stand right. going and keep it going? Because, yeah, you know from living in South, autumn olive is a huge one, and bush honey song, but we're actually doing research on autumn olive and impacts on uh, nitrate leaching. And we're showing beneath the autumn olive stands, we're showing as high nitrate end levels in uh, soil water and groundwater as below actively managed cornfields. Oh, wow. So that surprised us. There's that much excess end fixation in those autumn thickets. 
Because if you read an ecological textbook, it'll say those end fixing plants, those early colonizers, well, you know, they won't fix much more end than they, they can use and maybe the next plant can use. But that isn't what's happening, in, at least in our world. <laughs> we think there's a lot more end being fixed than, uh, than they can use. There's a lot use. of areas to study that down there, too. Yeah, I mean, Audemars, if you wouldn't believe it, is a huge problem that we deal with. Probably the biggest invasive species problem. And it was planned it up to even when I first got to SIU, it was still on some planning lists, unfortunately. Yeah, up here, Audemars is certainly invasive. Um, I personally am warned to a uh, forested buffer along a, a stream, but, but good. Here, <laughs> good. Yeah, yeah. But up here, all streams have been channelized and, yeah. and converted to these drainage things called drainage ditches. ditches. And um, you know, it's a reality. Right. So to do this whole thing, we're going to have to get the drainage maintenance people. Uh, of which I'm one, I'm actually okay. uh, We're going to have to get people like me on board to a different maintenance strategy. Yes. And it's it's doable, and it's a good strategy. It's just a, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of embedded conditions to it. That's a very good point, and something I talk about in my watershed management class. Repeat question: uh, Drainage ways. Of course, we kept keep. The question was, I guess it's more of a comment, yeah. that, you know, in terms of riparian restoration along drainage ways, we have these straight drainage ditches. And how do we, how, do, how can we restore these areas? Uh, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's something I talk about in my watershed management. Because we have drain, we have the same thing. Not to the extent you guys have here, but we have a lot of straight, straight and channelized drainage ditches in Southern Illinois, too. Um, especially in our wetter areas. And how do we effectively restore those areas and how do we, you know, change the mindset of the, the drainage districts? Because they want to keep those babies free and clear, right? And keep that water flowing downstream, right? I mean, that's, that's what they've been taught. You can't blame that. Well, because that's what they've been taught and that's what they've promoted. So we, we need a different mindset. And I totally agree. But how do we do that? is through training, through education. Yeah, and, and also, the, uh, even in a channelized stream, a drainage ditch, uh, tree roots have a great function. And it's, it's, more a, it's more a mindset of recognizing it and embracing it I, I than, hope than anything else. Yes. Yeah, I hope one day before I pass that we'll see more tree buffers, uh, but <clears throat> even in our neck of the woods, it's most producers are just want to talk about grass. There are a few that will be open to the idea of planting trees, but not many. And I'm sure up here it's even less than percentage. Your research with that, um, you know, it's what do you anticipate NRCS might do with your data as far as translating that into a practice standard? Yeah, well, the long-term goal, uh, the question was how do, how do we envision NRCS utilizing um, some of the work we're doing with the buffer blocks on a practice standard? And, and actually, in that grant, our long-term goal was to create or is to create an actual standard. And it would be more of a modification of this existing uh, I don't know what they actually call it, but it's a hedge, stiff stem grass hedge, that is it's actually in the, uh, it's an amend, an addendum to one of the existing standards. But I think it's buried. Like, it took us a while to find it. And I don't think a lot of people know about it, so more promotion. But we're, we're not creating something new here. Other smarter people than I have thought of these things. I think it's just continued... Uh, promotion and trying to put it all together in a, in a neater package, maybe with more better landowner acceptance. But yeah, that's the idea is for us to work closely with NRCS and to continue to follow this, hopefully trying to get some grants for some monitoring 
to see how well these things perform over time. Maybe they won't work that well. You know, we, we don't know. We think they will. Anything else? Yeah, I'm a little surprised in your block, uh, your block buffers that you're creating almost a wall for water against water entry. And in classic waterway maintenance, I didn't realize these, these aren't exactly waterways, but in classic maintenance, uh, if you don't keep them mowed, you are in big trouble, at least mowed to some extent. Right, and that is an option. Uh, but these aren't grass waterways. You, first, you're dealing with a lot less flow, even though it is concentrated. Because we'd still promote, if you have enough flow, you need to put in a grass waterway. So this wouldn't replace grass waterways. This would be an addition on a smaller drainage way. And I wouldn't even call it a drainage way. These things are pretty, I, I should, I need to take some better pictures of what they actually look like. Uh, these are just small granulations, small dips, you know, where you can see, yes, water was traveling through there, but it would be much smaller than like any NRCS agent would ever put a waterway on. But there's a lot of them. So they add up to being a lot of flow coming through the buffer. There's a lot more, like where you'll have one major drainage, like grass waterway from a, from a large field, you'll have maybe eight to 10 of these small ones that are interspersed between that, those large ones. So yeah, we don't, you know, it is a different way of thinking. And it's not, yeah, I wouldn't say we're creating a wall because you're still going to have water, because like switchgrass is a clump grass. So you're still going to have, it's not going to be a total, even though we're calling them hedges, there's going to be <clears throat> opportunities for that water to meander through there still. We're just, we're trying to slow it down and get it to infiltrate. Because yeah, we don't, you know, the last thing a landowner wants is a bunch of water sitting on their field because we just put in a barrier to water flow. Because then they really won't use it. You know, if, 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 we're having, if we're backing up water onto their uh, eye ground. Well, let's uh, thank our speaker and then if anyone has any